Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I want to thank um, Christina and Katerina for inviting me to moderate the event today. My name's Emily Scott, and before I make a few very brief introductory comments, I just wanted to make sure that everyone's clear on the, the order of events, which is in your program. So um, basically, we'll have a first panel with three speakers. I'll introduce each of them, uh, and they'll have roughly 20 minutes, and then there'll be some time for questions and answers afterwards. We'll have a break, and we'll come back, and there'll be two more speakers, and then we'll have all the speakers come together for a short roundtable. So I encourage you throughout the day, if you have questions for individual speakers or if you have questions that kind of uh, grow over the course of the day, to bring those to um, these various points of discussion along the way. So I'll just make a few uh, brief comments um, before we launch into our first um, invited speaker. The origins of the modern public museum, interestingly, both in its art and natural history varieties, can be traced back to the 16th century cabinets of curiosity, or the Wunderkammer. These were private collections, displays of wealth and worldliness, microcosms that reflected the collector's taste and mastery over uh, an idiosyncratic set of specimens, which were in some cases open to public view, in part to encourage the emulation of the aristocracy and along the way to secure its status. Today, I would argue, uh, as many others have as well, that distinctions between the public and the private are often highly ambiguous or becoming more difficult to tease apart. Although I fully agree with uh, Chris Derkin's um, comments in the afterword to this book, which you'll hear about later today, um, that it's important that we remain attentive uh, to institutions' respective relationships to the public and private realms, even as these realms are becoming entangled in new ways. Let me give you one example of an encounter that I had myself with a rather curious institutional beast uh, in 2016, namely then the freshly minted Hauserwerth and Schimmel Gallery in downtown Los Angeles during the run of its inaugural exhibition, Revolution in the Making, Abstract Sculpture by Women, 1947 to 2016. So upon encountering this institution, the first observation which is quite obvious was the scale of the building, which more closely approximated a museum than a gallery. Once inside the exhibition, there was a mixture of works that were on loan from uh, major and important uh, contemporary uh, museum collections and gallery objects that were for sale. The latter of which were being actively written into the former, or you could say that these contemporary artworks that were on display as part of the gallery show were being written into the history of art. Other fixtures of this institution include, included well-trained docents who were scattered throughout the spaces, happy to speak um, about the artworks, very well educated, um, a bookshop and a courtyard cafe. So there was a very seamless mirroring uh, of the trappings of a public art museum. And I think it's safe to say that an unknowing tourist that stumbled um, into this uh, institution in the recently gentrified corner of downtown LA that's now known as the Arts District uh, might very easily mistake this for being a public art museum. So I bring this example here today, even though I realize it is not a private museum or a public museum, so it's not exactly our focus, uh, which today here is the private museum, but I bring this example here today because I think it represents a new and hybrid formation in the quickly changing institutional landscape of contemporary art. And we could point to numerous other new formations, maybe not quite so new. Um, the, the rise of the global biennial and grand scale commercial art fair, we're of course here this week in the context of one of the, the kind of most important and long-standing art fairs, the Art Basel. Um, but these kinds of large-scale exhibitions, global exhibitions, have spread at a wildfire pace uh, in the past decade. We could also think about Freeport art storage, such as the Geneva Freeport, not so far from here. Um, these spaces, which were examined by the Berlin-based artist Hito Sterl in a series of essays on what she calls duty-free art, uh, in efflux between 2015 and 16. She identifies these uh, new physical spaces um, as being, very ominously she describes them, as being um, among the most important spaces of art today. And she describes them in these various essays as the, quote, dystopian backside of the Biennale and as pace, uh, spaces that uh, bypass nat national sovereignty. 
places that, quote, withdraw, withdraw artworks from the world by hoarding them, unquote. So it's a really interesting set of reflections I recommend. We could also um, look to artist-initiated institutions and counter-institutions, including museums. Here, uh, Yayoi Kusama's museum in Tokyo, which opened last year, or a slightly um, less well-known example, the Museum of Post-Natural History in Pittsburgh, which was initiated by the artist Rich Pell. If we wanted to zoom out even further, um, we might further scrutinize these new formations of the contemporary art world relative to broader contexts and conditions. So over the last several decades, of course, the economy itself has, has become globalized in new ways. Um, and this has led, among other things, to increased competition between museums in a global market. Uh, the American artist Andrea Fraser, in her ever sharp observations, links this kind of intense competition between museums for audience to the rise of star architect museums or the incorporation of star architects into the museum world. We could also think about the growing gap between the most wealthy and the other 99%. We could think about the, the widespread defunding of public cultural institutions in recent years. Today, our focus uh, is very specifically on one species uh, within this landscape, um, the private museum. And um, what I think we'll learn about today, and certainly is um, reflected very beautifully in this book, The Private Museum of the Future, um, is that it's a very varied, or there's a lot of variation within this species. Um, and as Christina pointed out in her introduction, um, it's a type of institution of which there are not only many more of them all the time, they're proliferating very quickly, but um, they're of tremendous importance and influence both within the art world and beyond the art world. So I'm sure you join me in looking forward today um, to hearing from some of its leading proponents and commentators. Uh, and I'm, without further ado, I will introduce the first speaker, um, Jens Forschau. Jens Forschau is an art collector, founder of Forschau um, Foundation, co-founder of the leading production company uh, for VR, um, VR Art, Cora Contemporary, and founder of the new Contemporary Art Center in Copenhagen, Copenhagen Contemporary. In 1986, uh, Jens Forschau established Gallery Forschau in, um, excuse me, um, in 1986, he established Gallery Forschau in Copenhagen and Forschau Gallery in Beijing in 2007. After a 25-year career as a gallery owner, in 2011, he transformed Forschau Copenhagen and Forschau Beijing into a nonprofit exhibition spaces under the name of Forschau Foundation. Since 2015, Forschau Foundation began to host shows as parallel program during the Venice Biennale uh, in Venice. In the end of 2018, uh, Forschau Foundation will open, excuse me, <laughs> um, will open um, its doors in Greenpoint, New York. And uh, I think with, without saying further, I'll let you take over from here. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for <coughs> coming here and listen to me today. And thank you for the introduction. As you heard, I started out as a gallerist, an art dealer uh, in 1986. Um, I very soon learned that it was a good idea if you want to promote young artists to also be an art dealer. So I went into the secondary market very early in my career and made the money in the secondary market and used them to promote the young artists, to go to art fairs, to make exhibitions. And suddenly 25 years passed uh, on the way we, op <coughs> we opened up a space in uh, Beijing, uh, had the idea that now we would sell a lot of art in China. I soon learned that that's not something you just do because Chinese, first of all, have to trust you and see who you are and that takes quite some time. So as we were not selling anything, we just started to just make great shows. We didn't need to think about if they could sell or not. Uh, and 
as that's one of my big passions is actually to make shows. I thought, why don't we just stop making commercial shows and just do uh, non-commercial exhibitions? Could you talk a little more into the microphone? I, I will do that, thank you. And uh, um, I had the possibility to do it because we had over the years also built up a collection so I could work with the collection and then work with the exhibitions and decided to to stop being a gallerist and this transition uh, meant that we were closing the gallery in Copenhagen we kept the space in Beijing and started doing non-commercial exhibitions there from 2011 and in 2012 we moved into a new huge space in the North Harbor, an old warehouse we transformed and in 2019 we are, uh, I know you said 2018, that was the plan, <laughs> but right now it looks like March 2019 we will open up in Greenpoint, New York also in an old warehouse. Um, in 2016, after doing some great shows in uh, the North Harbor, I realized that it's actually too small. We need to do something really big in Copenhagen. And I got the idea to make Copenhagen Contemporary, uh, which I founded and, and um, I couldn't lift that myself, so uh, we managed to get uh, funded by bigger Danish foundations and uh, we made a pilot project at the Paper Island where we had uh, great shows by Bruce Nauman, Sarsi, Pierre Huck and a lot of others uh, over one and a half year. Uh, the building we were in was going to be demolished, we knew that, uh, and it's already taken down, they're going to build uh, apartments there. Uh, but luckily, we found an even bigger space, uh, also in the harbor area, where we are now uh, going to be for the next many years. And uh, we have also managed to find a new director who will take over after Jens Erik Sørensen, who came from uh, Aros and who was a very big help in, in putting up this uh, um, Copenhagen Foundation together with me. Uh, and that's Maria Nibber who have had her life in different places and the last place she was in was uh, Tate Liverpool. And um, she's gonna open in a new space here in, in um, later this month with Superflex and uh, Doc Aitken. Uh, yeah. But that's Copenhagen Contemporary is, is living its own life, getting money from other foundations. And we also now just learned that we are getting some support from the city and from the state. So it looks like that we are going to live there for a long time. And that's not what I should really tell you about today because you're probably more interested to hear how I am running uh, Fawasco Foundation. And um, the title of this uh, talk I wanted to call Substan Sub Sustainability in the World of Art, the Economic Ecosystem Around the Masters. And that, that was that, yeah. What I have been doing is I have had fantastic masters through my hands and um, from Edward Monk to Picasso to Richter and a lot of others and the money from that I use to make our exhibitions, to make our collection to well, not make but build our collection and 
also to produce art. Um, the You'll see here some of the pieces which I have had. I would wish I had been born rich because I would never have sold them again. Uh, but uh, they have been very important for me to come on and do what, what we do today where we collect contemporary art. And that's what I mean about the um, economic ecosystem around the masters is that the art world itself creates a lot of money. The artists who become masters make much more wealth than they ever could use in their life. But for me, that's what I can do. I can, I know how to buy them and I know how to make money on them. I, keep them for a while and through that um, manage to make enough to um, spend it on our, I think myself, quite uh, uh, ambitions, uh, ambitious exhibition program. And here you see some shots from our exhibitions in, in both um, Copenhagen and and Beijing over the last five years. Um, I will let it speak a little for itself. I actually love silence.
So this was some of the exhibitions which are funded by the masters. Uh, when we do exhibitions, we also get the opportunity sometimes to be involved in the production of the art. And uh, we have, when we had the show with Taiko Chang, we produced some uh, of his gunpowder drawings, which was a fantastic possibility to have. And here we have been involved with Lego production of Ai Weiwei. It's natural to do that in Denmark as Lego comes out of Denmark. So we were very honored to work with him on that. Uh, an artist uh, named Christian Lemmertz, who I have known all my life as a gallerist, I have uh, been involved in many of, in production of many of his sculptures, and still are. Um, Yoko Ono, when we made her show in in Beijing, uh, we produced this piece with her called Golden Letters. And then I've been involved in Core Contemporary, which I also was. Uh, co-founder of, where we make uh, virtual reality uh, works. This is uh, Yu Hong uh, and Christian Lemmertz and uh, Paul McCarthy. And uh, we have uh, many other VR projects uh, coming up here in, in the next year. Uh, I was also involved in the swings, one, two, three swing at uh, Tate Modern. In the production of that, I helped Superflex. Um, and then maybe the most exciting project I have been involved in was a trip to Greenland where uh, Liu Xiaodong uh, made a series of paintings and made a documentary film too. In the first place, he said, no, 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 it's too beautiful. I can't paint beauty. Yes, don't, I'm not going to do that. But I got him interested as Greenland also have a more dark side uh, in the society. And that's what he does. He document the life in different places of the world. And he made an amazing group of paintings. And I had for my first time in my life, the possibility, you know, not the possibility, I've had that most of the life as Greenland is a part of Denmark, but I went up there after 58 years. And I must say it's the most beautiful place I've ever been to. And I can only recommend you all to go to Greenland. There, it's a, He's painting outside, and it's pretty cold there, but uh, he, he managed. And this was in the middle of the summer. Uh, this photo is probably from the last week of August. Um, it, it reminds me of, of another artist who traveled up to Norway in the late 18th, uh, late 19th century, and that was Edvard Munch. No, no, not Edvard Munch. Uh, uh, Claude Monet uh, to paint there, and I, I have read some of his letters from there. He he was completely disturbed. People were terrible. The food was terrible, but the worst thing was that the light changed all the time. So to be an impressionist painter was very difficult. Um, Liu Xiaodong had some of the same problems because the light also there changed minutes from minutes, but they both ma managed to make some great paintings. Um, so that was another thing that the masters paid to. And uh, then we also collect and 
So these masters have also helped us into collecting, hopefully, the future masters. And I'll just show you some of the works we have collected um, in uh, Yes, I will. This is Ai Weiwei, and this is Fountain of Light, uh, which was produced by another institution, uh, Liverpool, uh, Tate Liverpool, when, when he had a show there. Um, this is also Ai Weiwei and Ai Weiwei. And this is uh, Tracy Emin. I'm, I'm bad at names, just so you know, so it's a hard job you're giving me here. <laughs> And this is uh, 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 Taiko tai Chang. Uh, and uh, this is Paul McCarthy. It's nearly six meter tall. An American hero, it's Charles Brunson on a horse. Here's another hero uh, from 1965, Georg Baselitz. Uh, a, a work full of European history and this is a rather late work by Anson Kiefer it's, this is Mona Hatung uh, it's small glass balls what do you call them what do you call these things in huh? marbles marbles we call them we call them glass cooler. Okay, I, I'll scroll it quickly. This is Ragnar Kjartarsson. This is Zhu Hong. This is Zen Van Ji. This is Bjarne Melgaard. This is Liu Xiaodong. This is one of the works from the trip to Greenland called The End of Winter. I love the way he makes the birds. It's just it's a little splash and there you have a bird. This is Elmgren and Dragstedt, uh, which you might remember here from Art Unlimited a few years ago. This is Yoko Ono. This is Zhao Xiaogang. This is also Zhao Xiaogang. This is Louis Bourgeois. This is Louis Bourgeois. This is Louis Bourgeois. This is Mark Tansy. This is Shirin Nishat. This is Bill Viola. The last piece Bill Viola have made. Uh, this is Tsar. This is one of the latest uh, edition. Uh, this is Robert Rausenberg. This is Robert Rausenberg. Robert Rausenberg is one of the artists who I have followed since we started the gallery and have been very involved in. Um, this is also Robert Rausenberg. And this is actually Galen Kalela. It's a Finnish artist who I'm just starting to learn about. Uh, around the turn of, 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 of the century, as a uh, 19th century to, uh, to the 20th century. He's an amazing painter and for me as contemporary as, as Munch. This is Omar Fast. And this is the latest edition, which we found here at Art Unlimited uh, the other day. Um, Richard Moss, an amazing piece. If you haven't seen it, go and see it. Uh, thank you.
Unlimited piece. This was also, yeah, one of, one of my favorite pieces yesterday at Unlimited that I saw. Um, we have just about um, seven minutes for Q&A. I do have some questions, but, um, and I thought it was really interesting how you, you kept coming back to this idea of the kind of art historical work, these kind of master works becoming the kind of means to support for you to support contemporary art production. I thought that was an interesting um, point that you kind of um, came back and back, back to again and again. But I'm sure some of you have questions. So maybe I, if anyone would like to ask a question, we can open it up right away. Um, if not, I can ask a question. Does anyone have a question for Jens in this bit of time we have left for Q&A? Dora, do you have a microphone coming here? Mm -hmm. You mentioned several instances of collaborations with public institutions, for instance, uh, Tate Modern, and how do these collaborations work, and do they uh, work in, uh, differently on, in different contexts, for instance, uh, Copenhagen compared to Beijing, because these are completely different uh, you're thinking about one, two, three swing by Superflex. I, I just supported that for, 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 for Tate. Uh, we normally do our own exhibitions. We lend out works to uh, museums around the world, also to Tate. Uh, one of our Rosenbergs were in the retrospective, which were going around. We also have loans to Mass Mocha and, and other institutions, so in that way we we work with, with other institutions. We also have a show right now which uh, we have, where we have lent works uh, is to um, the museum in uh, Leipzig. But, uh, and we also work with institutions in <coughs> China. We have uh, given loans to, to uh, uh, museum exhibitions there as, as well. Just following on from that question, given that that possibility of supporting other institutions was always open to you, um, why did you decide to not continue just to support other institutions, but to make your own? I have not been supporting other institutions, and I didn't support Tate, I supported Superflex, because they were really in need of a little extra uh, money, which ended up being not a little bit, but a little too much, but we, we had to do it uh, because it was a very important piece, I think, a very social piece. And I'm a big supporter in terms of, we would love to loan our works to institutions, but we're not gonna support economically uh, institutions around the world because it's hard enough to make uh, what we need for for um, our own uh, program. Maybe I ask one question, yes. which is if you could tell us a bit more about the forthcoming opening in 2019 Greenpoint um, location, and also because you spoke just very briefly, you mentioned about the working in the Beijing context and certain kind of specific challenges or differences between working in these should I also use this? Okay, um, that's better. Um, you know, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about because you, you, the, working in these different contexts, because obviously the artists that you um, have worked with are very global. In it's a very um, global set of artists, but also you now have been in Copenhagen, Beijing, and will be in New York. So curious to hear more about the maybe motivation for working in New York and why that particular context, expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, for me to make exhibitions in Denmark have always been, I won't say easy, but we don't have a lot of competition there. We have some great museums like uh, Louisiana, but Louisiana is actually not in Copenhagen, it's 45 minutes north of, and the institution which is really worth to visit, not just in Denmark, but in the world. Uh, but having had, had made exhibitions in Denmark for, for more than 20 years when we opened up in Beijing was simply to, to get new challenges 
and visiting Beijing, and there I visited in 2006, and I felt a lot of uh, activity and life and an amazing artist community there. And I thought we could probably do a difference by bringing in Western art. And that was also pretty easy because nobody had made a Louis Boussois show, nobody had made a Robert Rosenberg show, nobody had made a Peter Doig show. So it's, it's not so difficult, but it's of course very nice. Now we need new challenges and so why not go to the most difficult place in the world, which is New York. And I tell you, I'm struggling with the first show. I have not, in terms of making a, an exhibition, ever had such a challenge because everything has been done in New York. So you have to think differently and we're trying to, to do that. I can tell you, I finished one room so far. We have had many, many ideas up, but one room will be the Paul McCarthy, which you saw, Charles Bronson and the horse, together with Geo Basel, it's uh, um, Rode Fahne. Uh, you have the whole American culture in, in um, Paul McCarthy's piece, I think, and uh, history also. And in, in Basel, it's painting, you have a lot of the uh, European tradition in painting and, and also European history in that piece. So I hope that will work and uh, we are working on some other rooms and some other dialogues and, and it's difficult not to be too uh, um, uh, pedagogic, I think you say, so that I have, it would be easy to take the Cézanne, uh, not the Cézanne, the Tansy where which is Mont Saint Victoire, and then take a Cézanne uh, of Saint Mont Victoire and put together. But that's too easy. I tried it, but and no, it doesn't work. So we are really struggling, but we will get there, and I'm sure we'll do something good. Thank you.